Bibles to John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. I'll be reading in the New King James Version. And the story we're going to look at this morning is the first miracle of Jesus. Water turned into wine. It says, On the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Jesus said to the woman, to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to do, you do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing twenty or thirty gallons apiece. Jesus said to them, Fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. Then he said to them, Draw out now and take it to the master of the feast, and they took it. And when the master of the feast had tasted the water that they had made into wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom. And he said unto him, Every man at the beginning sets out the good wine, and when the guests have all been well drunk, then the inferior. You have kept the good wine until now. This, begin, this is the beginning of signs that Jesus did in Cana of Galilee, and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Amen? Amen. You know, I love the word of God, but God does nothing by accident. It just wasn't an accident that he was at a wedding in Cana and they ran out of wine. God has specific purposes in everything. You know, many people will look at this story, and I've heard it said many times, they use it to indicate that it's perfectly fine to drink. Jesus turned water into wine so we can drink wine. And although you may take that away, is that the true message of the whole story? Some people believe that Jesus provides all our needs. And that's what we learn. He provides all our needs. He provided the wine that was needed. Yeah, that's good. He does that. But is that really the message of what he's saying? I believe there's so much more to this than first meets the eye when we read this story. You know, Jesus always spoke in parables. Jesus loved to tell stories that people could relate to and understand in the times and in the customs. The account we read this morning is not a parable or a story. It's an actual account, an event that took place. It is the very first miracle Jesus did to bring glory to God. Yet if we don't understand the customs, the people, the account, we miss much about this story and the deeper message that Christ was trying to convey. So, not... Dumbing it down, but kind of starting with basics, we're going to look at some things in this story. The first is we want to look at the participants. Jesus, we know is who? Son of God. The Son of God. Mary, who's she? Mother of the, mother. the mother of the Son of God. The disciples, who are they? The twelve. The disciples, those who followed the teaching of Jesus, they dedicated their lives to learning from him as their rabbi, master, lord. They knew he was God himself when he revealed it to them. The bridegroom. Some relative. He's the groom. The groom of the bride. He's the man getting married. The servants. They were hired to serve the guests at the wedding. They were the wait staff. They were hired in for that I would say day, but if you go back to Jewish weddings, it was two weeks. We thought we spent a long time at a wedding last night, four and a half hours. I can't imagine two weeks at a wedding. They would celebrate, and the family would provide food and drink and music and rest, everything that was needed for the family to attend this wedding. So, the servants, they were busy. They were not part of the party, they were not part of the family, but they were hired to serve. The master of the feast. The master of the feast was the person in charge of setting the tone for warmth and joy celebrating the married couple. Typically this was the father of the groom in Jewish customs. To us it would probably be like a wedding planner, DJ, 
kind of mixed together. They were in charge of hiring and managing the staff, managing the food, managing the drink. So when they ran out of wine, it was his fault because he was in charge of it. And setting the success for joy and unity between the families and guests. It was a very esteemed, honorable part of the ceremony, but a very one with heavy responsibilities. Now to understand some more of these things, not only do we need to look at the participants in the story, we gotta look at some of the symbols. There were water pots. The first account of it is there were six. Six is very significant because according to Bible scholars, just as the number seven typically um, tells us and complies perfection, especially of God, the number six is only shy of that by one. And it signifies man. More specifically, it refers to man, sin, and the weakness that he has. Mommy. Then it goes on to say these were stone pots for purification, for the purification process. In biblical times, or in ancient times, clay pots were used a lot, but clay pots could be contaminated. I found that interesting. If you used a clay pot, you could get contamination in it. And when a clay pot was contaminated, it had to be broken, it had to be dispersed, because if you tried to wash it or share it again, you would spread that contamination. You would spread sickness, you would spread disease. So stone pots were incorporated because stone pots were used for the purification process. They were to be filled with living, running water, fresh from the spring. This water was to be mixed with the blood of a red heifer. So here you have these huge stone pots. They would hold 20 to 30 gallons, carved out of stone. They were wider in the center to be able to hold the water. And at the top, there would be a narrower opening. And that opening was made so that a ladle could be put down and you could draw from that water pot to receive the water. And again, it was very specific in the word that these were for purification process. Purification process is we would take the water, the living water, the running water, the fresh water, and they would mix it with red heifer's blood. They would sprinkle in the blood that would bring about a cleansing that would take place for purification. So if they had touched a dead body, they would have to go and be cleansed and washed in the purification water. Their clothes would have to be washed in the purification water. They would have to prepare themselves for that cleansing that would take place almost a full week, sometimes longer. Uh, very specifically, they had to wash on the third day that they touched that dead body. So on day three, you better get there, you better get cleansed. Well, what's day three say? Wow. Day seven, they had to do it again. And they had to make sure that they were clean before they could go back into public. We understand the process of the woman with an issue of blood. She was not to be out in the crowds because she was hemorrhaging. She was not clean. She was not purified. They considered her contaminated. So when Jesus healed her, he said, go wash and be clean. So this is part of the culture of what's going on with these stone purification pots. We can find the process in Leviticus, um, if you want to study further on it. And it um, symbolized quite a lot. Then we have the wine. Wine symbolized joy, not to the point of getting drunk and brawling, but it brought about a happiness. Wine was always produced in the culture and given as a celebration feast, as something to rejoice, something to enjoy, something that brought hope and happiness. It was joy. But it also symbolizes the blood of Christ. Again, we have the third day. Jesus would raise from the dead. It's also the number of the Holy Trinity. The wedding. A wedding. We went to one yesterday. It was so much fun. Marriage involves spiritual, emotional, and physical closeness. The Old Testament teaches us that therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, shall cleave unto his wife, and they will become one flesh. They're unified in every way possible. So I continued to study. I'm saying, Lord, there's so much here. So then I began to look at Cana. 
Cana means a place of reeds, reed, a measuring rod, a rule, a balance. In our bodies, the symbol for it would be our larynx. <coughs> Cana of Galilee was the power of consciousness in the time period. The larynx, which is the symbol for Cana, controls our breathing, creating vocal sounds, preventing contamination into our lungs and our respiratory system. So when we broke down all these symbols and we look at all these participants, you might be saying, okay, this is all interesting, but what are you really saying? It's a lot of information, where are we going with this? Well, I'm gonna go back to John chapter two, and Bill, you can put it up on the board if you want, but I'm gonna read it a little different to you. So I will pause at different parts in the reading and interject something. On the third day, symbolizing Jesus' resurrection that would be coming in the future, there was a wedding, a union, spiritually, emotionally, mentally, and physical, in Canaan, the place of rule and balance, where we get our very ability to breathe, declare the truth, and keep out contaminants of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. Jesus doesn't push into places he's not first welcomed. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. We are at a wedding. The joy is now gone. Life's joys are only temporarily. They do not last eternal. The blood has not been applied. We're lacking here at this wedding. Something's not going right. The joy, the hope, the unity, the union, it's not happening. Jesus said to her, woman, now remember, this is his mom, woman, not mother, by woman, he was showing Mary had no special hidden access to the things of God just because she was Jesus' mother. She too had to pray and depend on God. We must always pray to God, not to Mary. That's right. It's important That's right. to catch. God's teaching us something here. Yes. What does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. My ministry hasn't started yet. What are you asking me for? I haven't started my ministry. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says, you do it. Mary's faith and trust knew who Jesus was, that he could fix things that no one else could fix. Her faith in who he was activated him to begin to release the ministry aspects of his life. See, she couldn't command him. She couldn't demand him to move in the power of God, but she had faith. She knew who she bore fruit of. He was the Son of God, and if anybody could help, it was going to be him. So whatever he says, you do it, because he's about to move. Now there were six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing 20 and 30 gallons apiece. Humanities, earthen vessels, designed to carry the living water mixed with blood that cannot be contaminated. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water, signifying they were empty. Without the living water of the Spirit of God not fulfilling their purpose. And they filled them up to the brim. God never does just enough. He always does in abundance, more than enough. I have a water bottle here. It's not full to the brim. Even when I first opened it, it was full to here. Because if it was full to the brim, it would be overflowing. For us, that would be a mess. For Jesus, he wants it to overflow. There's a purpose in it. Filled to the brim. Then he said to them, draw some out now. Now that the spirit of the living God, the living water, the breath of God, the blood applied was in these vessels, there's now something to draw from. You cannot draw from an empty vessel. Take it to the master of the feast. Any miracle of God can be tested, tried to be found, to be complete and accurate. Anytime God does a miracle, he does it in abundance. Like I said this morning, 
the man who was healed of, well, I, I didn't say this one, but the man who was healed of leprosy. His skin didn't just stop growing leprosy with dead, decay flesh. God said his flesh became new. He did over an abundance what was asked or thought. The lame man, healed, raised up, dancing, leaping, praising God. Not just shuffling, okay, I'm walking now. No, he could go in the authority of the Lord. Amen? Amen. God does everything in abundance. Then he said to them, draw some out. I said that, now that the spirit of the living God is there, you can draw, you can't draw from an empty vessel. Take it to the master of the cities. Any miracle can be tested, tried to be found complete and accurate. That's why Jesus said, you've been made whole, go show yourself to the priest. Be declared whole. And they took it. When the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made into wine, Joy had been given in full measure, complete, because the blood was now applied. Contamination and sin was removed. Joy was returned, now complete. No need to wait for the wine to ferment. Jesus always does a quick work. When you think about it, they brought it to the man that was in charge. You got to test this. They brought it to him. He's drinking the water, folks water that instantly turned to wine. The best fermented wine he had ever tasted. If anybody knows anything about wine, it takes a while to process and ferment and age. Yeah. But God can do anything he needs to quickly. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to take forever. God can move as quick as he'd like. It says he did not know where it came from. Man can't produce this. They can't figure it out on their own. But the servants who had drawn the water knew. They saw and understood that the vessels were filled with not only what God could provide, or only what God could provide. The master of the feast called the bridegroom, and he said to him, Every man at the beginning sets out the good wine. Every man puts his best foot forward. Every man puts his best foot forward. When you're meeting someone on a job interview, when you begin dating, when you begin whatever process your best is put out there, then it continues on. And when the guests had all well drunk, the inferior, you have kept the good wine until now. God saves the best for last. He's not like man. Man puts it out in front. God has it coming in store for us. His return is coming. Those who believe in him and call on his name for forgiveness of sins are in right relationship with God. He will be returning, looking for his eternal bride, the church. This beginning of signs did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. All who believed in the name of Jesus shall be saved, filled with living waters that overflow in our lives. Christ came to give us life and life more abundantly. This joy cannot be taken away. The blood has been applied. We must allow him to fill us with his spirit on a daily basis so that we can have living water for others to draw from. Amen? This is the meaning that I believe Jesus turned water into wine. Boy, there's a lot in there. When we first read it, it's just a simple story. Okay, he took water, he made wine. Great story. But when you look at the culture, when you look at the significance of where this wedding was, what was happening to the master of ceremonies, what was happening to the bridegroom, what was happening to the servants, what was happening to the stone jars for purification? They were empty. There were six of them in the house, and there was not one that had water in it. They were without purpose. They were empty. They could fulfill nothing. But Jesus came in and made a difference. Amen? Amen. If you want joy, if you want to be filled with the living water of God, if you want more abundant life, Christ is the only one who can provide it for us. He's here to provide it for us today. But you got to invite him in. 
You got him. I got him. We're going to invite him into our daily life. I can't give away Tuesday night. So I'm trying not to. <laughs> but Jesus will go only where he's invited. You can get up and start your day. You might say, good morning, Jesus. Love you. And then you run into the bathroom. Okay. That would be kind of like me calling Liz. Hey, Liz, I got to talk to you for a minute. Hold on. And she's waiting. And she's waiting. Oh, I washed my hands. I went to the bathroom. Oh, somebody rang the doorbell. Let me go there. Let me go here. Let me do this. Let me do that. She's waiting. Now, Liz is not God. She will eventually hang up and call you back and say, Hey, what happened? But we do that to Jesus. We can come to the end of our day and realize we have never taken the time to sit and draw from his presence and say, Lord, fill me up. We are a stone vessel. We are a stone vessel that living water is meant to live in. That living water is from the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. The Word says out of our belly flows rivers of living water. But if we're empty, we have no usefulness and no purpose for the Lord. But we need to ask the Lord, even as the servants do, what do we do? Well, fill it up. We come into His presence and say, Lord, fill me. Fill me that I might have joy again, that I might have life again. Yes. And the Father fills us with His Spirit. And the amazing thing is, it's mixed with blood. Mm -hmm. But it's not heifer's blood, it's the blood of Christ that removes every contaminant out of our life. I don't know about you, but going through life, sometimes we pick up things we don't even realize. Have you ever had something on the bottom of your shoe and somebody says, hey, you know, Olga, you got something on your shoe. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, I was just in a public bathroom. I didn't think I picked up anything, but hey, I did. <laughs> we go through life, and the enemy and people around us try to put things on us. Mm -hmm. You ever been around negativity? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Negative, 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 negative. Yeah. You start your day, you're happy, you're joyous. Negative, 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 negative. Yeah. Hi, hi, yeah, mm -hmm. I'll smile. We have to be careful what we allow to contaminate our day. We have to be joyful before the Lord. We need the Holy Spirit to fill us because we cannot be joyful in ourselves. Right. When we're going through things, when we're facing situations that are beyond our help, the Master of Ceremonies had no way to fix it. He budgeted, he planned, he planned the music, the musicians, the food, the drink. They ran out. Day three out of a two-week venture. He was in trouble. They didn't have enough. He couldn't do anything. He couldn't run to a local vineyard or a local wagman and say, give me some more, even if he had the money. It was done. But Christ was on the scene. And we need to draw from Christ. When things are beyond our control, we have to look to him and say, Lord, fill us up. Yeah. Fill us up. Fill us up. Fill us up to the brim. Fill us up to overflowing because within us we are empty without Him. Right. And all we can see is troubles and failures and problems. But there's something that happens when the Holy Ghost begins to fill us up. There's something that happens when God's Spirit begins to bubble up inside us. A spring of living water. That purification jug only could have running water from a stream or a fountain that was fresh. That's the only water God wants within us. He doesn't want our water to get stagnant. He doesn't want us to be a dead sea where we're always taking in and never giving out. He doesn't want us to just be complacent. You ever have water? I love fresh water. You ever have the water that's been sitting in the sun for a while and it's hot and it's warm? You've left it in your car? And you come back in the heat of the car and the heat of the sun and you go to take a drink of what you think is going to be refreshing and hot. Mm -hmm. And it's like, ugh. <laughs> Still water. Mm -hmm. But it's not fresh. It's not fresh. We as believers want to give out fresh life. We don't want to be carrying stagnant, dull life 
and say, hey, I'm a Christian. Jesus is great. Pastor used to always say, the donkey face, I serve the Lord, you shall follow me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Which way did you say you were going? Okay, I'm going the other way. We want to have the freshness of God's life. John chapter 10, verse 10, in the New King James Version says, The thief comes to steal. Come. Okay, the thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Mm -hmm. I, meaning Jesus, I have come that you can have life, that you may have it more abundantly. Run it over, bubbling over. There was a song they used to sing when I was a kid. Bubbling, bubbling, it's bubbling, it's bubbling, it's bubbling in my soul. I'm singing, I'm shouting, because Jesus made me whole. <laughs> Folks can't understand it, but I can't keep it quiet. It's bubbling, 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 bubbling day and night. <laughs> and that's, that's what we are to be, a bubbling spring for him. If you're already a believer, you've already accepted Christ into your life as Lord and Savior, the question begins to be then, it's not that you haven't applied the blood to your life. It's not that you haven't allowed the Holy Spirit to enter your life. The question begins, are we in constant relationship with Him? Do we take the time to be filled? We need to first be filled for our own lives. If I don't take time to fill up, my husband may not want to be around me because I'd operate in the flesh. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. If I don't take time to fill up, my kids may not enjoy being around me because I speak differently than when the Lord is flowing through me. I'm just human, and if I can do it, we can all do it. I mean, God wants us filled firstly for us but for then everyone we come in contact with. God wants them to be able to draw from us. My husband as my mate should be able to draw from strength when he needs it. I need to be able to give an encouragement word or a word of, of discernment or something when he comes and asks. My children, when they're seeking wisdom from God, I need to be able to pour it out and give it to them. Sometimes those calls, Olga and Nita, I'm sure you guys know, two in the morning, Liz, three in the morning, four in the morning, doesn't matter. They call, we're there. Are we ready to give life? If we take time with him, we're ready. Sometimes it's our parents that call. Sometimes it's our parents in need. You know, when I first started visiting my mom and she couldn't speak, I wasn't sure what to say, didn't know how much she'd understand, and then I realized, I got the gift of gab, just talk to her. She'll listen. She'll just sit there and make faces at me, but she'll listen. So I started telling her of my day and telling her what was going on in my life and my husband's life and my children's life. And then I started thinking, oh my God, I've made her a venting board. It's not her place. I'm there to encourage her. What am I pouring out? So then I started reading the Word of God to her. Life. Started reading. I still tell her about things going on so she knows the joyous things, but I don't unload to her. I give her joy. I give her life. I give her the word of God. I sing to her. That's kind of comical for all those in the hall. Sometimes we'll do a Christian video. She loves the old Bill Gaithers or the old Happy Goodmans, and we'll pull them up, and those are songs I heard in my childhood. I'll sing with them, and she'll smile, and she'll catch it, and... I talked to the, oh, recreation director. I had to think of what the name of it would be. It was the recreation director that kind of plays games with them, does bingo, puzzle. What can I get your mom involved in? She stays in her room. She doesn't want to be around nobody. That's my mom. Yep. Mm -hmm. What can I do for her? I said, well, I know it's a Jewish community, and I know she knows enough about the history of God that she may enjoy it a synagogue service. And she says, well, what's your mother's background? I said, well, we were raised Pentecostal, non-denominational. She goes, we have a Baptist church that comes in once a month. Would that be okay? I'm like, absolutely. <laughs> so the other time they come in once a month, they, she got mom up, she got her dressed, mom was fighting, combatant, didn't know what was going on. She kept pushing her, we're going, we're going, we're getting on the elevator, we're taking a ride. 
She gets her in this room. Mom sits down. She says, your mother's looking around like, what is going on and why does she have me here? And then they began to sing Amazing Grace. And tears just rolled down her face. Do we have life to give to people? We do. Because Christ is alive in us. We need to be ready to minister to all people at all times. They came down to do the clean sweep. Thank God for Ryan. Each of them poured out through relationship, through joy, through having fun, cleaning up streets of East Rochester, picking up garbage in the rain. But God used it as a tool to reach somebody, to let them know that God loves them. And I pray he comes. We're going to be praying for Ryan. Remember, pray for Ryan. And if you're here on a game night or here sometime and Ryan walks in the door, be ready to pour out. Let it draw from you the living water of the Lord. Amen? Amen? This constant relationship is the most vital part for us. But always remember, Jesus doesn't go where he's not welcome. If we don't take the time to invite him into our day and take time in his presence, he'll just watch us go about our merry day in hopes that we'll call on him. And unfortunately, a lot of times it's when we go, Help, Lord! We find ourselves in crisis. Help, God, I need you now! And he's kind of like, why didn't you see me this morning? You would have been ready for now. Ooh. <laughs> Let us get ready, get ready, get ready for the encounter with the Lord so that we can be filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen?